splendid museums now exist in and around Britain for trams. London's Covent Garden is one of them. Many trams of all types are in store, but here they have a few on display. Here are a small collection of London trams like this West Ham vehicle. Children can climb aboard to try out the controls too. Models here are in plenty. Remains of old tram tracks still lie around the city streets. In Hoburn, central London, is a relic from the once intensive tram network that serviced the city. It's the Kingsway subway, the northern entrance still here more than 35 years since the last tram ran through it. It closed in 1952 when the London trams left the city streets forever. Cars now use the centre section so as to avoid the Strand. It was originally constructed for single deck cars but later opened out for double deck trams to use. It came out on the embankment underneath Waterloo Bridge. These scenes have come to light from private home movies borrowed from the Finchley Cine Society. They show the three different types still in service. Behind this sports day in Finchley, one can see one at the Tally Ho. The charter celebration in Finchley in 1932 had this in service. Apart from Blackpool and the Isle of Man, and perhaps the cable cars at Landino, there are no trams running in service anywhere. The electric trolley bus and the diesel bus sent them packing. Most of them were scrapped. Here at Leeds, many ended their days. Some lingered on only like these to be smashed up by vandals. This unusual vehicle was originally on the Swansea and Mumbles Railway. The Swansea and Mumbles Railway provided a quick and efficient link between Swansea and Mumbles Pier. These cars, dating from 1928, were the largest passenger carrying electric vehicles in Britain. Each car could seat 106 passengers and during busy periods would run in pairs. The original company's line, somewhat shorter in length, carried passengers in 1807 and is acknowledged to be the first passenger carrying railway in the world. After horse and then steam traction, these electric cars were fitted with air brakes and the usual air-driven hooters. All doors were on the landward side only. Their final livery was red with a cream band and a silver roof. The line ran along the shores of Swansea Bay and had it not closed down in 1960 would most likely be a tourist attraction today. attempt was made to preserve a car. The Middleton Railway Trust offered a temporary home on a siding, but the enthusiasm of the preservationists waned. And like many other schemes, 
Vandals and weather reduced the only existing Swansea and Mumbles tram to a rotting hulk. Grimsby Docks, for many years one of England's largest ports, famous for its fishing fleet. In 1908, however, it was felt that a larger, deeper general purpose port was needed nearby. The Great Central Railway decided to build it at Immingham, just up the coast from Grimsby. Today, Grimsby folk drive over Corporation Bridge to work at the new docks. But things were different in 1960 when these scenes were filmed. These cyclists are heading for the tram, which would take them to work. This was British Railway's only tramway system, the Grimsby and Immingham Light Railway. Working on the overhead wire at 500 volts, it had a short but fast running line of six miles. This ran directly across the marshes and fields to the new docks in 20 minutes against the round trip by road of 11 miles. When the tramway opened in 1912, it started here at Corporation Bridge, right in the middle of Grimsby Town. Towards the end, however, due to traffic congestion and planned road improvements, it was cut back to the edge of Grimsby at the Cleveland Bridge, and this was done in 1956. Car number 11, built in 1913 by the Brush Electrical Company, had 64 seats and four folding ones in the central entrance. It was typical of the first designs ordered by the railway company in those days. These were the longest trams in Britain, 54 feet long, and they used the standard gauge track of four foot, eight and a half inches. Before the tram started, a steam coach ran on the adjoining goods only track for the benefit of the dockers. At shift changeovers, there would be at least six cars running together. It was a very handy service, only taking half the time of the replacement bus service. There were only a few request stops on the way, so a high-speed run was enjoyed. A track relay would warn the level crossing keeper about an approaching tram. speed running all day and most of the night, it had a half hour service then, the overhead wires needed a fair amount of maintenance. An ex-Gateshead tram of 1925 came to the line in 1951 and is the regular works tram. Other second-hand cars came too, more from Gateshead and some from Newcastle. One Gateshead tram is preserved at the Beamish Outdoor Industrial Museum of County Durham. One of the original long cars is at the Kreitsch Museum in Derbyshire.
This bridge is near Immingham. It's at the stretch of line that trams leave the fields, come round a curve and join the main road. Today, the poles are still there on the curve. And on the road, just as the replacement bus passes. Back in 1960, works tram has finished. Meanwhile, number 11 is on that curve about to join the road, seen at the top of the picture. The works tram is waiting to reverse down into the curve when number 11 has cleared the point work in the middle of the road. The line from here did once run into Immingham village, but was poorly used and finally pulled up in 1955. Now number 11 has changed over its poles for the reverse run into the dock area. I'm afraid this chap isn't having much luck today. right up to their ships, very conveniently. During the First World War, the whole area was turned into a torpedo boat and mine laying base for military purposes only, so less use was made of the trams. Some cars were stored and new orders postponed for a while. The little station survives today and has gained a new porch and a very different occupation. The docks, well, they're still very busy handling cargo from all over the world, and it has a very efficient rail service of lines to serve the shipping. Back again, though, through time, and we're on our way to Grimsby. end of the tramway's life in 1959, the night service finished and the off-peak service was replaced by buses. But the line was very popular right up to the end in July 1961. Over 2,000 passengers travelling daily on the trams. Grimsby citizens have, even today, many fond memories of the old swaying tram cars. At the oddly named depot, High Wipe, the works tram blinks in the sun while some maintenance is still going on. These men, all British Rail employees, will soon be redeployed on DMUs in the Grimsby area.
The car sheds are now a scrap metal dealer depot. Just weeds remain in the yard. The whole tramway is now just a memory, like so many of those interesting lines that are no more. with trams are known as green men. The women, well, they're just called flippies. We uh, regret, all the people anyway do regret the passing of the tram car from the city streets. <clears throat> Buses, to my mind, don't get you there any quicker than did the tram car and at a much greater expense to your wearing apparel by the rug and tug of the seating in the bus. At one time, many routes extended a long way out on reserve tracks, and it was possible to take a tram as far out as Airdrie. But with the increase in the number of buses, the longer routes were closed, and the trams have been confined to the city boundaries for some time. On the London Road route, the number nine has to turn round here at Achenshagel. I started work as a conductor. You had to have two very important persons voting for your character before you were admitted to the service. We missed much social life, but we had plenty of entertainment and sport amongst ourselves.
Look, I'm sure the old folks will, Mr. Trams. I think the old folks, I'm quite sure the old folks will miss them. They were handy. They moved tens of thousands in football matches. Golf was my greatest game. It took me to London, it took me to Edinburgh regularly. Inspector, after 37 years with the department, and as a result of an accident, I was forced to leave. I journey along Argyle Street from centre of the town here to Kelvin Hall in a bus is no enjoyment at all compared to a journey in a tram. bus, you're overcrowded, <clears throat> you have the fumes from the ghastly diesel, whereas on the tram you were free from all that. <laughs> Certainly there was a degree of dust in the summer weather, but I rather think the tram far outweighed the bus in that respect. And when they had the old colour scheme, people didn't even need to read. They knew that the blue car went one way, the white another, and the yellow another. Blue trams for Mary Hill, green trams for Paisley and Deirdre, and red trams for Springburn. At one time, you could travel all the way to Baloch by tram, changing at Dilmuir and, as far as I can remember, at Dumbarton too. It was a long journey in those days, but a most enjoyable one. You could get out on the top of the tram in the open air and see the country as you ambled along, very pleasantly. Now this swing bridge, which we pass over, spans the Fort and Clyde Canal and is operated by the man in the wee bridge house on the other side. If the bridge is about to open, the light turns to red and the points just by the crossing there are automatically shifted. Now, do you see the other wee house there on the left hand side? If the points were against us, we would demolish that house when going at speed. Two or three have already landed there, but fortunately they did manage to stop and no damage was done.
passage of time, I suppose we should look to more modern means of transport. The buses have taken the place of the tram, but while it has meant much faster moving traffic than was in the tramway day, I don't know whether we can count it an advancement. visit the Isle of Man, the little island that offers transport enthusiasts so much to enjoy, from steam engines to trams. This is Douglas. On the promenade is the quaint horse tramway. They started in 1876 with three cars on a single track. Now they have 30 in service between May and September. Douglas Transport Authority must be unique in employing a blacksmith, a vet, and buying 200 sacks of oats annually. Derby Castle Terminus, or should we say stables, passengers can transfer to the Manx Electric Railway. Most of these cars date back to 1893, being saloon and toast rack types. That's the Summerland which suffered the tragic fire in 1973. The system started as a line to serve the new housing estate at Douglas but was extended to Laxley and Ramsey in 1899. The three-foot gauge runs a total 17 miles along the coast. point is at Laxley, where it meets the start of the Snaefell Mountain Railway, a separate tramway. This five mile line is a different gauge, three foot six inches. The cars are wider to necessitate the extra braking equipment required to grip a centre rail which is laid on the gradients of one in twelve. Now we're passing the famous Laxley wheel once the main part of a huge pump built to keep the Laxley mines clear of water. The mist is thickening as we climb up the mountain. At the top, bog bound, so it's into the cafe for a cuppa. In a large quarry in Derbyshire, Critch, is this full working tram museum. Trams from all over the country and the world are on show here, and most of them are running too. From Glasgow to Hungary, trams of all types are here. 
This is an old Blackpool vehicle, soon to be restored. The facade of a recited town hall is the perfect setting for a tram museum line. This tram car from the northern city of Sheffield is one of 40 in the museum being restored for people to enjoy a ride on a scenic mile long track. It starts in a tramway period street where iron railings, stone cobbles and authentic tram stops are set. Much of the tramway is built on the site of an old mineral railway track to a limestone quarry. Trees and bushes have been planted by the track. Ten years ago, it looked like this. Today, an old bandstand amongst the picnic grounds gives visitors a very pleasant way of viewing passing trams. <laughs> this recited bridge will carry new tracks over the main line to the car park, providing a new branch line. This single decker is from Blackpool, the northern seaside resort. A London tram dating from 1916 has been beautifully restored and is very popular on this sunny day. Trams from all parts of Britain are here, and this one is from Hungary. The main line singles here, and this is the receiving post for the token when the tram returns. On this busy day, trams swap the token directly. The depot and workshops are full of tram cars being restored and there's always plenty of overhead cables to maintain. Oh, my God. 
While on the tram, the conductor gives us a little chat about the history of this particular tram car. This seaside town runs trams along the site of an old railway line. Little trams like this trundle up and down, giving rise to the holiday makers and enthusiasts alike. They are designed in a two-third scale on a track gauge of two foot nine inches. They were originally at Eastbourne until 1970. The terminus is a car park in the centre of the town. Cyril brings up our tram. It is original control gear from an old full-size tram. And Cyril, our driver, tells us all about the tramway. There's five trams running and there's two in the depot and we got the, uh, the shop, which you saw down the bottom there. Uh, this was built, I think, 1968, I think. Uh, they're all, all, of course, all handmade, they're all, all made from, from scratch, except the controls. The controls are all original tram controls, the motors, uh, the overhead, as you've noticed, is all the uh, tram wire, the trolley heads, they're all, all tram pickups and that. The governor, that, he uh, acquired it, laid the tracks down, and owed it up in 1970. Uh, there was about a little dispute down at Eastbourne about the being down there. He, they didn't mind us being down there, but they didn't appreciate us. The whole journey is 35 minutes return, quarter of an hour each way, the five minutes stop, and the service is fares from 15 to 12 minutes on the service run. At the end of the line, a real Victorian loo awaits us as we arrive. Beyond the gates, a further extension to open next year. Holiday makers can enjoy many features of the line, including wildlife. That report was filmed in 1977, and now, 1986, ten years later, we pay a second visit to see what has happened on the line. Across the River Axe, the depot is getting ready for the day's activity. The tram nearer the camera is a number 12, and it's much longer than all the others. They have extended their running line past an important level crossing to an old station at Colliton. The level crossing did cause problems at first, but this was resolved by fitting automatic warning lights and bells.
Number two, now in a different livery, passes us at Colliford. The tramway cannot extend any further because the railway bridges have been demolished beyond Colliton. But it can continue to give pleasure to many visitors for years to come. Near the Beamish Hall is an unusual station, a neatly preserved old steam branch with a difference. It wasn't here before. It was transferred stone by stone from elsewhere to form a part of the unique Beamish Outdoor Industrial Museum. Today a Sheffield tram is in use, somewhat out of period. It runs up the main street, passing shops and houses to its terminus. Eventually the street will have a bus depot built and somewhere lying around in piles they have a complete gas works waiting to be erected. be imagined the museum employs quite a number of staff to maintain the buildings and tramway to its present condition. It has a well-placed tram shed with a few spares available for duties. An ex-Gateshead tram is used some days. The ride stops here for a visit to a farm for refreshments or even a walk down the hill to a mining village recreated around an old coal mine nearby which in due course will allow visitors to go down to see the old workings. Dudley near Birmingham is another industrial museum. An old pit has been rebuilt too. There were 40 mine shafts around the site once. The tram here is a genuine old Dudley vehicle rescued from being a chicken house on a farm. Like most of the Midland trams, it's of the three foot six inch gauge.
Like Beamish, a street has been reconstructed for visitors to explore. The shops have people dressed in period costume to show visitors what shopping was like years ago. Even electric trolley buses are here, more behind. Meanwhile, the Dudley tram trundles up and down about 30 trips a day until other trams being restored can take turns. Cable hauled trams have always been rare in Britain, and here in Londidno, a unique system still exists. Opened in 1902, the cable runs below ground in the street section. The line was constructed in two separate sections, two cars on each. In this typical wet day in North Wales, holiday makers can get out of the rain and go for a ride up to the Great Orb. The overhead wire is only for communications between drivers and the winding house. Maintenance men keep a lookout for rubbish fouling up the cable underneath. At the top of the first section, a changeover. Passengers walk between the two sections and find the next car available. Up and down all day, the original cars, over 80 years old, still run, reaching the top of the Great Orm. A transport museum at Lerstoff has a fine collection of vehicles, some of which give little runs up and down.
This superb London tram has only just been restored after 35 years in storage. Finally, what better than to finish this recording with the only place in Britain still to keep its tramway, Blackpool. Blackpool claims to have had the very first electric street tramway in 1885, using the conduit system for current collection. They changed to the overhead wires in 1899. The corporation decided to modernise its fleet in the 1930s instead of scrapping like every other town and city in Britain was doing. The fact that the trams have had their own separate roadway has helped to prolong their usefulness. And they're not only a tourist attraction, but a means of getting to work and doing the shopping as well. as you enter works on this tram. She's taking us to Fleetwood, now on railway tracks. Fleetwood reminds us of what most towns and cities looked like in the 30s. Ordinary trams with ordinary people. to Blackpool as it's getting dark. The world famous illuminations are being switched on and the trams take their place in this unique colourful display of light.